It was probably about two months later. I had yet to drill with the headquarter battalion when I got a phone call from the XO of the battalion who said, uh, I'm calling to tell you that you're being deployed. I said, really? Uh, deployed when? He says, I can't tell you that. I said, deployed where? He says, I can't tell you that either. He said, uh, it's classified right now. The mission is still in the, in the final planning stages and has to be approved by President Bush. It's a high-profile mission, but I'm calling because I need you to be the primary trauma physician with a unit that is going to deploy into combat. All I can tell you is it's somewhere in the desert. Uh, I said, uh, Captain Boglin, are you aware that I just got back from deployment six months ago with the war in Iraq? He says, yes, uh, I'm aware of that. He said, but, but this is a high-profile mission, and we really need someone with your qualifications to, to do this because um, it's, it's the first mission of its kind with the Marine Corps. And... Um, if you don't agree to do it, I have to try to find someone else who can fill that, that role. So now he, now he really had piqued my interest, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So he said, okay, great, uh, I'll be you know, back in contact with you uh, soon. So what you have to understand is the Marine Corps figured out that in every conflict up to and including the Vietnam War, the majority of combat casualties that died on the battlefield died from either blood loss or a delay in them receiving care for their injuries. The care was basically performed by medics who were, for the most part, inadequately trained and definitely inadequately equipped to handle severe combat injuries in the field. So they were trying to figure out how to improve their survival statistics, and they came up with this idea of, well, well, why don't we try deploying physicians with the infantry troops in combat so they're there when, during the combat to take care of the injuries as they occur. And guess who their guinea pig was? So, uh, so a couple weeks went by. Captain Boglin called me back in and said, uh, okay, you know, Missions planning is completed. President Bush uh, authorized it. And uh, the mission is that, that you will be the primary trauma physician with the, a specialized combat medical unit um, that has been handpicked from commands around the country. You're going to attach to the 1 6 uh, recon battalion out of Camp Lejeune, and you're going to be going into combat in Afghanistan to stop the Taliban from blocking the presidential elections that are supposed to occur, occur that, that year in September. And uh, he said, we've come up with a name for your unit, and we're going to call it a shock trauma platoon. So now I need that PowerPoint. So in essence, I was going to be deploying into combat in Afghanistan with a unit that I had never met, never trained with, and we're going into combat together. So, uh, so this, talk about shock trauma platoons. This is a PowerPoint that I, I subsequently put together after that deployment um, to use as a training tool. Uh, and the premise of the shock trauma platoon is basically taking medical care to the fight. Uh, this is sort of what a uh, you know, setup would be for a typical shock trauma platoon where you've got a triage area, a treatment tent, and then there's another tent behind here that's uh, like a holding tent. Um, this is sort of what it would look like just in a, a training exercise. Uh, the premise, again, is to deploy medical personnel with the infantry troops in combat, so they're actually there when the casualties occur. Um, it's comprised of basically two emergency physicians, a trauma nurse, uh, occasionally a PA if you can get one, uh, 10 or 12 corpsmen, and around six Marines to drive the vehicles, provide communications, and also to provide perimeter security 
when you're trying to administer care under fire or in an urban uh, warfare situation. Uh, has its own, all of its own equipment, uh, its own vehicles, and it, there's a number of different layouts for it. The one I prefer is this one because it tends to flow better. Uh, there's a number of scenarios that it can be used for. Again, this was for training purposes, which I'm not going to bore you with, but this is the way it's used primarily where you would, you would set up at a fire base and then go out on missions from the fire base or accept casualties to the uh, shock trauma platoon or STP uh, from other uh, operations in the area. Um, in a convoy, you know, when you would, you would join a major convoy, this would be sort of the configuration of the, of the uh, STP. And again, the communications were basically handled by our enlisted Marines, and uh, and like I said, they would provide security um, for uh, you know, for us when we're actually under fire trying to take care of people. Um, so uh, we got our orders, uh, went to San Diego. We only had five days to prepare for the deployment once we all converged there. And that included doing our pre-mo checkout stuff. So, so basically, I had five days to get to know these, these members of my unit. And, and fortunately, Captain Boglin was right. They were pretty much the, the best and brightest of their, of their respective units. Um, so they, they, they knew what they were doing. I uh, went through some combat medicine briefs with them and, and evaluated their surgical, you know, their suturing techniques and things like that. And so we left and went to uh, uh, Camp Lejeune, met up with the other third of the unit that were attaching to us from uh, Camp Lejeune, and then uh, we headed over to Afghanistan. Now, uh, we, we flew on C-17s to Manus Air Base in Kazakhstan and then took 130s down to Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. From there, we were going to go out to what was going to be our fire base. So this is uh, the 130 that we headed to Kandahar. That's me. This was my XO, Lieutenant Allen, who was absolutely indispensable during that deployment. And they attached a psychologist to our unit last minute in Camp Lejeune because they didn't know what the hell was going to happen when we got to Afghanistan. <laughs> Uh, this is Kandahar. This, this is basically the core uh, from my actual 4th Med Battalion of my shock trauma platoon. The, the whole base at Kandahar, it's a huge base, air base, is this rock because you know, it's in the middle of the desert and otherwise you'd have dust blowing all over the place. Um, and then this was just some debris from the bombings that went on after 2001. Uh, this is just another view of the base. This was me, and we were getting ready to head out to uh, what was going to be our fire base. So this is where they dropped us off, in the middle of the freaking desert. Um, and there was nothing but desert east and west of us and south of us to the Pakistan border. We were in southern Afghanistan. North of us, you can see part of the mountains. You'll see a, a little better view in a minute, but, but there was a mountain range uh, that was uh, north of us where a lot of the Taliban were, were hiding out. So we were pretty much sitting ducks when we first got there. And, uh, and basically our fire base was tents, command tents, big GP tents, and our individual tents like these. Um, that was the command tent. There's our tents again. Now what started happening Almost immediately when we got there was we started getting mortar attacks about every third night. The Taliban would come down uh, from the mountains. This is my tent, by the way. Uh, they would come down from those mountains, fire off a single mortar, and then head back to the hills again and see if they could hit something. Um, they were getting a little better at it. I know that because when you're in your tent and you hear a mortar go off and then you feel debris hitting your tent, it's close enough for me. 
So what they had us do was pull up our tents, and they brought bulldozers in, and they dug these trenches. We called them graves. <laughs> and what they dug up, they put it in a horseshoe configuration to absorb shrapnel, figuring that if one of these takes a direct hit, you're going to have a lot fewer casualties than if one of them hit that big sea of tents in the middle. Uh, this was our bathroom. Um, and uh, they, they started building these latrines here, which were basically these plywood structures with a hole in it and a 50, half of a 50-gallon barrel underneath it to do your business. But you could not urinate in them because there's no sewer system, so all the stuff had to be burned. So as a result, they planted these things in the sand at different places around the base. You'd use that first and then go to the latrine. They affectionately call these piss tubes, which is a pretty good name for them. <laughs> I put this picture in. You can't really see real well. The, you could, there's actually structures in here, but the full moon was a very dangerous time of the month because it was, and it, this moon's just coming up, it was like daylight out there. And it was basically a sniper's dream. So if you had to move around at night during a full moon, you hustled and you zigzagged, you didn't, you didn't saunter along, uh, or you become a casualty yourself. This was just some of our firepower. These little dust devils were constantly all over the place. It got to the point where we just ignored them. You can see this Marine walking out to the latrine, he didn't even care, you know. Uh, it was just so commonplace. Uh, once we had all the tent structures up, uh, we built this Hesco barrier wall. Hesco barrier is like a accordion plastic structures with metal frame, and they fill them with dirt and sand and rock, and it forms about a, like a six foot wall around the perimeter. And then we had our security outposts around around the outside of that wall. This is uh, another other side of the command tent. This was our shock tunnel platoon. We're getting set up. You can see the, you know, the triage area and then you know, flowing on down. This was just where we would hang out. You'll see that in a minute. But uh, here we're getting our, our equipment ready. So this was a typical trauma bay. And it was like our little mini ER. We had three of these in the tent where we had uh, you know, monitoring equipment, uh, suturing chest tubes, uh, ventilators. Um, all of our power was supplied by generators when they worked. And fortunately, uh, all these this equipment had battery backup, which came in very handy. Uh, this is another one and another one. Um, this was that holding tent, so this would be on the back end of the treatment tent. And casualties that weren't real severe, we would just put there and then release them back to their unit. The casualties that needed to be medevac would go here first, and then we'd medevac them onto a higher echelon of care, usually to Kandahar, Charlie met at Kandahar. That's me uh, working on somebody. I'll spare you some of those details. We had two uh, 155 howitzers um, that used to return fire when we get the mortars. And we had two helicopters that were ours. These were about 100 yards from our STP uh, to either go pick up casualties or uh, fly casualties to Kandahar. Uh, they built a little chapel for us. We, the, the Marine Battalion had their own uh, priest, and he used to serve Mass on Sundays for us uh, when we weren't out on a mission somewhere. And we were basically eating MREs three times a day uh, for the first couple months that we were there. And then we sort of, they built this little makeshift chow hall, um, and they started flying in tea rats or tray rations for us, so we had one hot meal a day after that. Uh, we would pool all of our boxes. We only got mail like once a month because there was no airstrip there, so they would helicopter <laughs> stuff into us. So we would basically pool everything we got, you know, and, and, and share it. This was the only shade we had that was on the end of that other picture. This is our you know, cami netting. It was 125 degrees <clears throat> every day. Um, so if you weren't here, you were out in the sun, basically. <clears throat> uh, here we're getting ready to go on a combat mission to uh, one of the towns looking for Taliban. 
uh, it was, there was constantly dust blowing around, so my shutter didn't always work too well on my camera. Uh, we're heading into the town now on this road, and there it is. And these are what most of the towns in Afghanistan looked like. <clears throat> uh, our Marines would perimeter, uh, sort of do some perimeter security cordon off an area. We would commandeer a, um, like a, a, a school, uh, like a room in a school or a medical facility. We would let the elders know that we were there. I would bring a couple of corpsmen with, and we would tell them we will see any Afghans that you have there that have medical issues for the four or five hours that will be there while the rest of the Marines are knocking down doors looking for Taliban. And they would come. Basically, the whole freaking town would show up. <laughs> you know, and mostly wanting pain pills and antibiotics and things. Um, the recon battalion had its own BAS, you know, sort of a, its own little medical that was, that were Navy personnel. Um, and they had a couple of dentists. And they would come with us sometimes when we went into these towns, and they'd basically just yank teeth and give people antibiotics for gum infections and things. Uh, this would be a typical room, you know, that I would commandeer to, to see, you know, the Afghan people. Uh, here is that triage tent, so we're, we're, we're getting some casualties in here. Uh, this Marine had a gunshot wound through and through to his calf. Uh, here we're, we're on one of the mountain... Uh, uh, Convoy is one of the combat missions up in the mountains. We would usually either bring some local Afghans or Afghan National Army with us because they knew the areas, so they would act sort of as guides. Uh, here we are sort of humping through the mountains. This is not fun times, particularly when you're in your mid-50s doing this stuff. Um, so on a typical mission, when we would convoy... It wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when you were going to get attacked because our, we would get our intel from the warlords because they hated the Taliban because the Taliban were like the mafia there and they'd shake them down and take all their drug money. So, so they'd tell us where the Taliban are hiding out, so we would plan a mission to go where they are. So uh, typically you'd be convoying along, you'd start getting small arm fire or RPG rocket fire at the convoy. So... You stop, get out of the vehicles, return fire, call in air support, and the Apache helicopters would fly in, fire off the missiles, and end of story. And you just go up and start counting body parts or anybody that survives you would capture, we would capture and, and, uh, for interrogation. Uh, this man here is alive, basically. He survived one of the missile attacks. Uh, I spent hours putting him back together so we could keep him alive to interrogate him. I'm going to skip through a few of these pictures because some of these guys didn't make it. Uh, most of them would literally be vaporized. There'd be nothing there. You know, and some of them maybe were more peripheral would die from blast injuries and things. And like I say, literally there was maybe only one or two that would ever survive these attacks that we would, we would capture. The most of the, the ones that were captured were captured during the urban uh, maneuvers that we did. Uh, there's one of the Marines in his foxhole at night, you know, a little campfire going. This was a little weapons cache that we got out of one of the uh, caves in those mountains we were humping through there. Uh, again, uh, we, we broke an axle on one of the Humvees on one of the mountain roads there, and we just left it there. Uh, this, I can't remember now if, if um, we were going to pick up a casualty or if we were on our way back with a casualty to Kandahar, uh, this is a CH-53, had 50 cals on either side. Um, since I was the basically the trauma surgeon for the for the uh, deployment, uh, not uncommonly I would fly with casualties to Kandahar, spend a couple days in surgery with the trauma surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon, and then heal back to the uh, fire base. The way the missions worked is that there, since there was two of us. Uh, when one would go on a mission, the other would stay at the fire base to accept casualties. It was a, it was a joint task force mission uh, with other services. We had Army Rangers. We had uh, Delta Force. We had SEALs. Uh, we had uh, 82nd Airborne. So, uh, so, like I say, there was casualties coming in from combat operations all over the place. 
Uh, this is another dust devil. Uh, this is just a view out of the back of one of the 53s. Uh, here we are on another mission. These are, these are Afghan National Army vicious fighters. These guys, vicious. Uh, again, another convoy. Here we're back at, at Kandahar before we demo back to the States, and this was a, one of the frequent sandstorms that would come through, uh, which is why they always had, had this rock here, because otherwise you'd be in constant sand all, dust all the time. Uh, so a little food for thought for you. Um, you can put up that other one. I'm sure everyone in this room has either been a patient in an ER or accompanied someone who was a patient in an ER, or at the very least has seen one of these shows like Grey's Anatomy or ER or, or Chicago Med, whatever, where you know the emergency room doors fly open, they, they wheel in all these, you know, these patients on, on gurneys, and they're surrounded by a bunch of doctors and nurses and hospital staff. They're, they're shouting out, we need, you know, for lab work, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, this one needs to see an orthopedic surgeon, this one needs to see neurosurgery, this one needs to see a cardiovascular surgeon, this one needs to go to the OR right away. All of this done in a relatively safe, clean, well-lit environment with every lab, x-ray, and specialist available within minutes. So compare that to being the only trauma doctor in a 200-mile radius working out of a tent with no lab, no x-ray, no on-site surgical capabilities. Oftentimes, your only light source being your headlamp when the generators weren't working, which was not uncommon. In 125-degree heat with daily sandstorms lasting a couple hours uh, where you can't literally see your hand in front of your face, and your only medical backup being your corpsman, whose training is basically whatever you've taught them, uh, and they're basically your eyes and ears to help prioritize casualties, because you can only see one at a time, um, and to sort of direct you, you know, uh, and getting four, five, six casualties in at a time sometimes, <laughs> and do this day after day for six months. So welcome to my world. Well, I'm, I'm happy to report that the mission was very successful. It was probably, it, well, not probably, it was the most physically and emotionally challenging thing I've ever done, uh, but extremely successful. Uh, we basically reverse the statistics. The, uh, historically, 95% of the injuries, that, the, you know, the severe injuries that we, that we treated would have died in, or did die in previous conflicts. In our case, 95% of the injuries are alive. When we got to them or they got to us, we saved. So uh, the Marine Corps was thrilled. They worked, they worked great. Um, so they were right, basically, with, with their supposition that that's the only way you're going to make things better is be there when it happens. Um, as a result, they, um, uh, when we got back to the States, I was tasked with forming up four of these shock trauma platoons in our battalion, which I did. And I spent the next uh, few years training physicians and corpsmen uh, with the shock trauma platoons, arranging field exercises for them. I developed the, shot, the mass casualty protocols for the battalion, and we would do mass casualty exercises. And, and, uh, um, and that's what I did for the next few years.